or try it with the history. If you get the history wrong, you might as well send the patient away. It's pointless. You'll never get the right answer. None of the tests. It's a waste of time. Two key elements of the history. You have to find out whether the person is there. Oh, that's the controller. Because of vertigo or imbalance. If you cannot decide, is the person here because they're having spinning or staggering, forget it. You will never sort the problem out. And it depends on linguistic contact. I mean, I can't do this in Greek. We have a lot of non-English speaking patients. I usually don't bother to take a history because I know through an interpreter I'll get complete rubbish. I have no idea what the interpreter is asking. If I ask them, do you spin or stagger, a 20-minute conversation is used. The answer, they say, yes. Great. Very helpful. So it's very, very difficult to take a history across a language, That's a reliable history. If they can't decide whether it's spin or stagger, and of course, we're talking about vertigo or ataxia, different problem. Ask them, do you have the problem when you're sitting down? No, sitting down, I'm fine. Well, that can't be ataxia. But you have to be sure they understand. If they only have the problem when they walk or stand, you know you're not dealing with unequal activity. You're dealing with lack of activity. It's absolutely fundamental. Is it unequal vestibular activity, which is the basis of all vertigo? Or is it a lack of vestibular activity, which is vestibular ataxia? So you have to get a, a, a reasonable answer to that. If your answer to that is unreliable, you're probably wasting time. Because you'll do tests which are abnormal and you have no idea what they mean. Are they relevant to the person's complaint? The other thing is for the slightly more experienced clinicians who keep seeing patients who've seen three other doctors before, the key question I try to settle is, look, what is it that you want me to fix for you today? I don't want to hear what happened five years ago, or you know, you, you fell out of your pram as a baby. I don't want to hear about that. As you're sitting there now, and I have a magic wand, and I can fix you, boom, like a fairy, what one thing do you want me to fix? Not five things one thing. So if they bring out a list, I take the list, I screw it up and put it in the bin. If you need a list to tell me what's wrong with you, there's probably nothing much wrong with you. If there's something really wrong with you, it'll be on top of your mind. You don't need a reminder. But in a consultant vestibular practice, if you don't do that, your life is constantly made miserable by people. You can't decide are they psychological, neurological, or vestibulological? What are they? Or are they everything? So I'm not trying to replace David Toker's talk, but I'm talking about the person not in the emergency room. In the emergency room, the history doesn't matter. It's the examination that counts. If there's nothing wrong on examination in someone with the emergency room, that becomes either a non-problem or an impossibly difficult problem of the person who's had an isolated vestibular TIA, and within a week they'll have a brainstem stroke. If you have an isolated vestibular TIA, it is undiagnosable. There's nothing to find. If that is that, you will have a brainstem stroke in five days. There's absolutely no point in booking them to a clinic six weeks' time. So the truly, truly serious things in neurotology give you very little warning. It's a real problem and you won't see them because most of you don't go to the emergency room. If they come to your clinic, they almost certainly cannot have any serious cerebrovascular disease because they would have had a stroke by then. They triage themselves out. So office neurotology is really easy. There's virtually nothing serious. I mean, there are a few odd things. But the serious ones are all either stroked out or dead. Because once you start having vertigo from vascular disease, it goes very quickly. You want me to hurry up? Okay, all right, good. End of history, okay? But I mean, what I'm trying to tell you, if that bit is wrong, 
the examination, well, examination may give you a bit like veterinary practice. Could we have the first video, please? We'll need the house lights down. Number one, what, number one video, bilateral impulse. Okay. Could we have the lights off? Good. Some of these are very easy, but what I'm saying is what you can detect with your hands, no equipment required. You can do it on the spot. Oh, this is an old one. There we go. Slowly, there's no catch-up cicada. Nothing, because the visual system can do it. Right? Slowly, you'll find nothing wrong. Turn the head too slowly, you'll find nothing wrong. Visual system will do it. So this is a person with severe bilateral loss who has completely normal compensatory eye movements with slow head movements. Of course, that's the visual system. Now what, look what happens when we go a bit faster. There it is. One. You've made the diagnosis. No test. I know what's wrong. You had too much gentamicin. Or I'll never know what's wrong. Because if that's all that's wrong, the hearing's normal, there's nothing neurological, if it's not gentamicin, you will never make a diagnosis. There's almost, I don't know of any other definitive cause of severe bilateral loss, isolated, without hearing loss, apart from gentamicin. There's some true rarities. And there it is vertically. You don't need a test. You've made the diagnosis. Okay, next video, please. Okay. So the next, number two. Yep. This is a more recent version, which is even easier to see. There we go. Nothing to it. Person had endocarditis. They kept sending them around for audiograms so we could make sure they're not poisoning the inner ear. Even at my hospital, they haven't learned that gentamicin doesn't affect the ear. If you want to see it in slow motion, here it is. One, two, three, four, five, there it is. Boom. So if you don't have any recording equipment, use your camera and play it in slow motion. If you're not sure about it. That's so long as it's an overt saccade, not if it's covert. Okay, next video, please. Number four, yeah, top four. Number. Okay, this is a unilateral. Here's very clear on the left. Nothing on the right, unilateral. Nothing on the right. There'll be a little bit, actually, because it's not a perfect VOR on the right. Now look in slow motion. One, two, three, four, five. There it is. About 200, 250 milliseconds. This man has exactly the same deficit, exactly the same. He's had a nerve section, but you cannot see those saccades exactly the same deficit. Cannot pick it clinically. And that's because he's covert. He's making his saccade so quickly during the head movement, your eye cannot tell it from the VOR. Your perception. So, all right, let's... The reason he's wearing a thing in his mouth is so we can measure head velocity. That's not necessary. Okay, here is slow motion. I cannot pick it in slow motion. One, two, three. <coughs> Not there. How? Because it occurs during the movement. It depends on the frame rate of the video. So those ones you can only diagnose with the video head impulse. So what it means, if you think the head impulses are clinically normal, it doesn't mean they're normal. It's a false negative. It may be a false negative. It may not be. You cannot tell a normal head impulse from a false negative head impulse because the saccades are covert. If they're overt, you don't need a test. If, if they're normal, it doesn't mean there isn't a deficit. Could I have the next video, please? 
Now, you know, this is not hard. Anybody in my department do it. The nurses are better at it than I am. Now, this is just to show you this, the same video showing the graded head velocity. So if you go slowly, head velocities of 100, very hard to see. So if you go too slowly, you can't see it. So it's either covert or your stimulus is too slow, you can, it's not there. And that's, this is by far the commonest mistake made by juniors, is they go too slow. They don't want to get a vertebral artery dissection, which is complete nonsense, of course, it doesn't occur. Here it is going at 200. You can just see it at 200. So in terms of what you do on vi uh, video head impulse, it's the mid-range. So if you only go to 100, you can't pick it. Not only you can't pick it, your video vestibulometry won't show it because it's not there at 100. You haven't reached inhibitory saturation of the existing lateral canal. That's how the whole principle of the test is you go fast enough to reach inhibitory saturation in the off direction. So there are some ways of getting it wrong. Could I have the next video, please? Okay, this is truly cute. Mons, this is for you. It, it works with, with, with translation in some people. Isn't that cute? Thank you. I think that's just wonderful. So there is a li there's your linear VOR that people have, you know, spend half a million dollar centrifuges on. All you need is a pair of hands. Let's see it again. I like this one. Everybody understand? This is a head heave. This is not angular. This is linear. No, no, back, back, previous one. Yeah, number six, yeah. Isn't that good? It's the, one of the biggest ones I've seen in terms of catch-ups of cards. This is translation. This probably, I mean, everything stimulates the canals. I'm sure that gives a tiny bit of a canal stimulus, but it has to be mainly an overlithic stimulus. But it's not there in everyone. I don't know why. Okay, the next video, please. Okay, now just put it up and just pause. That's it, just pause. Yeah. This is really difficult, but if you understand what's going on here, you understand almost everything about the vestibular system. This person is lying on his back. He's looking at a spot on the wall, and all I'm asking to do is, while you look at the spot on the wall, slowly turn your head from side to side. Couldn't be a simpler test in the world. Okay? Now, a normal person, of course, will make perfectly smooth compensatory eye movements through either the vestibular or the visual system. And if you do it slowly, it does uses both. It's a redundant system under one hertz. So let's turn it the other way. Suppose your patients, doesn't have to lie on their backs, they can look on the spot on the wall, but this was a convenient way to do it. If your patient is fixing a point in space and you slowly turn their head from side to side, and they cannot make smooth eye movements. In other words, either with vestibular or visual stimulation, they cannot make smooth eye movements. You've made a diagnosis. It's very rare, but utterly specific. And if you understand what's going wrong, you will actually understand a great deal about the vestibular and visual system. You have to have lost both all vestibular function and all smooth pursuit. And of course, to lose all Smith pursuit, you must have a pretty bad cerebellum. So this shows, let's see the video now, please. He's turning his head from side to side, looking at a spot on the wall, and it's all saccadic. Get out of the way. Okay, all right. <laughs> okay? It's all saccadic. On top, he's wearing a pair of goggles. It's, this is a video. This is, we're not measuring here. But there are no smooth compensatory eye movements, either visual or vestibular. Utterly specific. There is nothing else that will do this. And it takes roughly five seconds to elicit this sign if you know what you're looking for. 
So it is, in a sense, a slow head impulse test, in a sense. You're moving the head slowly, and if you cannot compensate, it means the visual system must also be gone. Could we see that again? Visual, I mean pursuit system. But could we run it again, please? It's as simple as that. No smooth compensatory eye movements, either visual or vestibular. And it's the same on the vertical side. I haven't shown you that here. And it is, it is about the easiest thing to see. Just have the patient look across the room, turn their head slowly from side to side. The movements are saccadic. You've made a diagnosis. There is probably, well, it's not quite true. There's only one thing that really does it. This is the cerebellar ataxia uh, with vestibulopathy and neuropathy, canvas syndrome. Okay? It's a rarity. It's, of course, untreatable, as everything in neurology is. But it is, it is a highly specific diagnosis. The other thing that can, two other things can do it, for which, for canvas, we do not have the gene yet. But the two other things look very similar is Friedreich's ataxia. But, of course, the other neurology of Friedreich's is very clear. And the other thing can do is SCA3. Spinocerebellar Mercado Joseph disease, as they progress, they lose vestibular function. So they get basically cerebellar ataxia with a progressive bilateral vestibular loss. The Mercado Joseph is the closest to it because it doesn't get a hearing loss. The Friedreichs does get a hearing loss. Okay, next video, please. Will you give me a two minute gun? Thank you. That's another one. Let's leave number eight out. That's not, no, that's the same. same disease in another patient. Let's see number nine. What's number nine? Okay, this is obvious. Everybody knows this. People in Korea know a lot more about it than I do. Of course, it's mainly with peripheral lesions, but in fact you get it with central problems as well. Cerebella and here we go. Patient's head eventually comes off, but... Boom, 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 boom. Some people hate it, some people don't care. Some people get terrible nystagmus and vertigo, vertigo with it and, and never let you do it again. Um, now, for, for the sort of the advanced vestibulologists in the audience, if you watch that video run to the end, you can already predict that the nystagmus will reverse. Because all nystagmus that last long enough will reverse if you keep watching for long enough. That's not abnormal, that's just basically the velocity storage integrator. And I think there's a bit at the end which, yeah, there, there it's going the other way. And if you wait for a long time, it'll, it'll do that. If you bother to record for five minutes after caloric, it always reverses. Okay, now, what's interesting about that from a peripheral point of view is that only some people with a total unilateral loss have this. If you have a total unilateral loss, everybody has a positive head impulse. If they don't have a positive head impulse, either they don't have a total unilateral loss or you don't know how to do the test. But this is only present, in my estimate, and I'd love to see some figures, only about half the people who have a severe total unilateral loss. And I have not in my life been able to distinguish what's different about them. What's different about those who do and those who do not have post head shaking nystagmus after a CV and lateral loss. Maybe Mons or some of the other wiser heads here have some ideas on this. Now, of course, what's important, it was really the discovery was made here, that this isolated head shaking nystagmus without canal paresis can occur with lateral medullary lesions. Central problems can cause isolated head shaking nystagmus. So it's a test well worth doing. Well worth doing, and of course with some cerebellar lesions, and sometimes the nystagmus goes crazy. You say, shake the head from side to side, and the nystagmus is vertical. It's, called, it's rather catchily called perverted nystagmus. Not all the patients, when I tell them you have perverted nystagmus, think that I'm making a very unpleasant remark about them. But I'm not. It's, it comes from French. Monsieur Toupe in France brought that word out. Okay. Could I have the next video, please? Now, this is a good one, too. This is the ENT people see this, or they see it if they know how to look for it. Where 
there's a young man there. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All I'm doing is I'm pressing on her ear, just with my finger. Very expensive test, pressing on the fi finger on the ear. Okay? Oh, she didn't like that. She didn't like that. So um, she had a cholesteatoma going into the lateral canal. Probably doesn't occur much these days, does it, with modern antibiotics, but it does, doesn't it? But you still have these lateral canal fistulas? I mean, I, you guys pick them up, I don't see them, but that one ended up with me somehow. Yeah. Okay, very easy test to do, Hennebert test, blah, blah, blah. You can do it many ways. Could we have the next slide? Okay, th this is, I feel almost embarrassed to show you this. This is, some, this is our, of course, our bread and butter, but if there are some younger ones in the audience who don't get to see this, well, they need more practice, okay? Um, it's got a quite, quite a little interesting aspect for the more advanced people too, which they'll spot. Here she goes down on the right, and you notice that there is just a touch, maybe, there's something there, there's something there. That's not the bad side, that's the good side. Just a little bit of downbeat. Coming up. Boom, 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 there we go. Now, let me just say, it is really, really important in real world practice to have a video set up. Not for you, because you could probably see it, but for the spouse sitting in the office who doesn't believe there's anything wrong with the patient. Oh, dizzy, she's always been dizzy, doctor. <laughs> I bet there's nothing wrong. Once they see that and you say, well, that's as fast as she feels she's spinning. Would you like to feel like that? Oh, no, no. Okay? It really gives, it's a very important humanistic thing to give the patient some validation to their loving spouse who doesn't believe a word they say. So it is well worth doing. And of course you can make a recording and next time they come back you, you can see what they've got. Could we have the next video please? Oh, here she, okay, this sort of looping round. Again, for the experienced people in the audience, this is nothing new, but I just, there may be some Younger people there haven't seen this. Why is he coming up again? Okay. Now, the, what I need to point out to the younger ones, the, with lateral canal BPV, the nystagmus is so fast in the beginning you can't even tell which direction it's going because the slow phase velocities are almost the same as the quick phase velocities. Now it's slowing down, you know that it's geotropic. But when it started off, you really didn't know. Okay, now the question is which side is it on? It's pretty bad on that side, but let's see the other one. Now Mons, I want you to tell him, this guy's a taxi driver, is he allowed to drive? <laughs> As long as, that's what I said. You mustn't lie down in the taxi. <laughs> okay, here we go. So which side is it on? <laughs> which side? Right or left? I think it's the right one. But, you know, if you record, the, you measure this, you can't tell which way it's beating in the first bit. You have to wait till it settles down. Okay, next video, please. Yeah, I had him back because I wasn't expecting it in the lateral. I was expecting it in the posterior. And I, I said, it's going anyway, just leave him as he is. So he's quite right. It's not the correct position for treatment, head up for treatment. But I, it was going, so let's go. All right, next one. This one is a truly, trivially easy clinical sign. Truly, trivially easy. But again, a lot of people don't do it. And absolutely specific, of course. Hold your thumb out, turn from side to side. Boom, 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 boom. Okay? 
this guy's got a cerebellar ataxia. Almost nothing else does this except congenital nystagmus. But of course, he hasn't got congenital nystagmus. Okay? I can't think of an easier clinical test than that. But again, it's not done. Okay, next video, please. Okay, here we go. This, of course, is generally done. This is a, uh, a, a not an easy test because there's no equipment required. <laughs> so this guy is asking, stand up, close your eyes, completely normal on a firm surface, no problem at all. Here comes the expensive bit of equipment. Okay. Mm -hmm. Adjust the pajamas, very good. There we go. <laughs> now close your eyes, my friend. Oh, kaboom, there you are, diagnosis. Nothing else does that but severe vestibular impairment, and it can be unilateral. That's the other mysteries of vestibular impairment I have never been able to solve. In my practice, about one person in five who has a severe unilateral loss will have a positive foam Romberg test. So I don't know why the other four don't. And I can't pick any difference. In no vestibular ocular test can I pick any difference whatsoever. Don't know why. Um, that guy again had endocarditis. Could we have the last one? No, that's it, 15, that'll do. Yep. Okay, and I'm sure you know all this, but the details of how to do the test. Start walking, keep your eyes closed. You must keep talking to them, otherwise they'll either open their eyes or stop walking. You have to keep talking. Keep talking, please keep walking, do not open your eyes. Keep walking, do not open your eyes. Keep walking, do not open your eyes. Otherwise, I'll stop. So he, of course, has no idea at this stage that he's turning right. And he's no idea, and he actually goes forward a little bit. In a moment, I'm going to tell him to stop walking, but do not open your eyes. I'll push him back so he doesn't run into the wall and ask him to continue, but he has not opened his eyes. Okay, go back my friend. But his eyes are still closed, he has no idea where he is. And I ask him to keep walking. And shortly I'll say stop and now open your eyes. The instructions are critical. And he'd just keep going around if you left him. Stop, open your eyes. Ooh, where the hell are you? Unilateral vestibular loss. Now, it's more com It's not as simple as saying acute or chronic, compensated, uncompensated. It's a very interesting phenomenon. There are other factors there. But if you see that happen, and the person doesn't have a hemiplegia or a wooden leg, there is only one cause for that. There's something wrong with his right ear. Okay. So what I'm showing you is an absolutely standard neuroatological examination. It takes about... 10 minutes, uh, backed on a reliable neuroatological history. And that's sort of the, the basic tools of our work. And, you know, this, it's not that all that hard to do. The problem we have is that I can teach this to neurologists because neurologists are very happy to examine patients, actually hands-on examination. ENT people sort of are happy to go above the neck, but... Uh, looking noses and ears, but shaking heads and looking at eyes. Eyes, they don't belong to the ears, do they? Well, what the hell's going on? 
Of course, audiologists who do a lot of work don't want to actually touch people. They want to stick things in, you know, a probe in the ear. The ones who are really, really good at it are the physical therapists. They goes, not only love to touch you, they love to torture you. <laughs> they are the absolute natural people apart from your eyes to do this. So thank you very much. I hope you all got something out of it. <laughs>